end of our very short time in the book of Revelation. Uh, we just basically dabbled in the book of Revelation over the last number of weeks, and this is our last morning. So today we're going to look at Revelation 21 and 22, not the entire chapters, but most of chapters 21 and 22, um, or chapter 21 and then the first part of chapter 22. And um, we're really focusing on the visions of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth. Um, so it's the culmination of the book of Revelation, it's the culmination of scripture, and it's the culmination of all of human history. So it's kind of... And to really, it's pretty hard to do that justice in uh, 15 minutes. So <laughs> we will see how that goes. Um, and it's about, and, and um, the, the people that I, I mostly refer to and so on is, um, there's so many sources out there. And so really, depending on who you study and what your own background is and so on, it, it kind of depends how you look at things. And uh, so just to be fully upfront, it's uh, N.T. Wright, uh, Alexander Stewart, and The Bible Project are kind of the three main ones that I use for this, um, for this particular message. Um, and so N.T. Wright puts it this way when we look at these visions. He talks about heaven and earth were joined together in Jesus, and then heaven and earth will one day be joined fully and forever. And that's the vision that we're talking about in Revelation. And it's actually, it's two visions, but it's two visions of the same topic, of the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth, is what it is. So as we go through it, um, I am, I will speak as we go through it. So I'm not going to read the scripture and then go through it. I'll just speak as we go through it, okay? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So this could be a completely new heaven and earth, absolutely completely new, but I would actually go along with uh, Alexander Stewart who says the Bible as a whole leads us to expect that this new heaven, this new earth to be a renewed and restored version of the current world. And if you think about Jesus and that he rose from the grave, he had a new body, but you could also recognize his body. You still saw the marks of the nails in his hands and in his feet, right? Let's continue. And there was no longer any sea. So it's, it's not that God didn't like seas or large bodies of water. He created the seas, right? It's part of creation. He loves creation. But in ancient times, the sea was seen as a symbol and the source of evil, chaos, uh, danger, disorder. So if you remember... Um, I think Pastor Aaron preached about the beast. The beast came out of the sea, right? So it symbolizes chaos and evil. So theologians suggest that the lack of sea suggests the removal of evil and suffering. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So down out of heaven from God. So Jerusalem... Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, powerful sy symbol. The, uh, the Bible Project puts it this way. It was the first and only city where God resided in a permanent holy house. The first city where kings worshipped the true creator. And at the heart of the Israelites' promised land, Jerusalem represented the ultimate promised land. All of restored creation. And so John depicts the, the reunion of heaven and earth as the descent of of the new Jerusalem. That's how he puts it. And so this new Jerusalem is prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The new creation symbolized as a bride, symbolizing also God's people. And it also kind of, it symbolizes physical space as well that encompasses, and we'll see this, encompasses the whole entire world. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Incredibly, God coming down to pitch his tent, dwell, make his home among the peoples. So right now, we have access to God through Jesus Christ, right? We pray. We prayed this morning. We worship. Um, 
but there's still, we know there's still a physical distance. We know that not everything is, um, is totally together. But someday, all this distance, barriers will be removed, and there will be a perfect blending of the spiritual and the physical realms. So what is life like in this? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Just sit with that a minute. That incredible tenderness and intimacy that that expresses. It's profound. Yesterday I visited Sherry's dad in the hospital and as I was praying with them, the, the family, they had a real sense, um, they expressed this after, that they had a real sense that Jesus was with them and he was there. But to think of a time when we no longer gather around a hospital bed in the agony of watching a loved one die. There's no longer any tears or sorrow or suffering. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious, those who overcome, we talked a lot about overcoming, right? Overcome will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my people the thirsty. What are you thirsty for? What are you thirsty for? Perhaps it's wholeness, health, peace, life. (coughs) What are you thirsty for? You will be satisfied. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. We cringe at this harsh language, or I cringe at this harsh language. But don't we long for evil to be eradicated, to be completely eradicated? Stuart puts it this way. Nothing that disrupts human flourishing and joy will exist anymore. God's personal presence and care is the guarantee of this. His presence is the guarantee that there will be absolutely nothing that can get between us and God anymore. The second death, the fiery lake of burning sulfur, is that literal? I don't know entirely. Probably not. That's my Sense a lot of theologians suggest that it's uh, it's likely a separation, a symbol of separation from God. Um, but whatever interpretation we do, um, evil will be no more. And then we come to the second vision. Same topic, God coming to dwell among the people in a new heaven and a new earth. So it's it's just like um, what often happens in Revelation, right? Uh, vision uh, describing the same reality, same time period, but with a slightly different focus. So one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, remember all the sevens, right? Came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, coming down out of heaven from God, It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Incredible, beautiful picture. And then I'm not going to read 12 to 21 in its entirety. It's all 12s. So I encourage you when you get home to read the whole scripture in one chunk, but it's full of 12s, 12 gates, 12 gates, but they're never shut. They're never shut. See, when you think about it, there's no fear of enemies, and all are welcome to come in. And there's many points of entry. With Lodgepole Communitas, we often talk about many points of entry, Avenue being one of them. Avenue is a unique expression, right, as uh, our own gathering, our own church, our own uh, gathering as followers of Christ. But we're also 
one of those entry points to Lodge Pole Communitas, that broader ministry concept that we're a part of. And uh, so all those gates, all those entry points in. There's 12 angels, 12 tw tribes of Israel, 12 foundations, 12 apostles, 12 precious stones, 12 pearls. And then the wall is 144 cubits thick, which is 12 times 12, right? A cube, uh, um, and then there's this cube, this square, 12,000 stadia, which is 2,220 kilometers. It's a square, okay? So think about that, 2,220 kilometers high. So th there's no way that can be an actual thing. It's got to be uh, symbolic. And symbolic also of the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies within the Temple of Jerusalem was a cube, was a square. Um, and according to Stuart and others, although there's some variations on this, but it's the concept that it's, uh, the, it symbolizes the entire world. That now, when God comes to dwell, to pitch his tent among humanity, his presence will be everywhere. There won't be any separate holy of holies. His presence is every, it expands into the entire world. Entire world. And it's this idea of the heaven and earth, the two dimensions, God's dimension and our dimensions are united, united together in wholeness. And the number 12 comes from the 12 tribes of Israel, of course. And uh, all those 12 stresses the unity of God's people. And, you can, and there's, when you read it, there's this real sense of abundance and prosperity. And then we read, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light and the lamp is its lamp. Uh, sorry, the lamb is its lamp. Will there actually be no sun and moon? We don't really know. But it is a way of describing God's greatness and how incredibly, like his presence his glory will be enough for us to see and to be able to live and know. know where we don't, there will be no darkness. And then there's another picture of what life will be like in this particular city, in this world, this new heaven and earth. The first vision, there's this really personal picture, right, of, of God coming to, to wipe the tears and it's just very personal and intimate. And in this description, it goes to the nations. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. It's a multi-ethnic multi city. It's the nations, all different nat nations, cultures, ethnicities, all coming together, coming together in unity. And we, we tend to uh, talk about salvation in, in terms of the individual a lot, something that is uh, it's kind of how we think. And, and you're right. God saves each one of us. But God thinks so much bigger than the individual. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, but he came to seek and save not just the individual, but all things new, to heal creation and to heal the nations so that the, the, what, the systems of injustice are healed. The warring between nations is healed. As we interact with each other in groups, all that miscommunication and misunderstanding is healed. God created us to be a people in relationship with, other, with each other. And he is healing those relationships. Nothing impure will ever enter into it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
So once again, in the words of, of N.T. Wright this time, that which ruins the beauty and wholeness of God's new city is ruled out by definition. It's ruled out by definition. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, 12 again, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So here we have the new creation describing the complete reversal of Genesis 3 and the curses that are described there. The curses that happened after um, humanity rebelled against God. To be full re restoration of our relationship with God as individuals, full restoration of how we function as nations and as groups together, <coughs> no more domination, violence, or war. And all of this is accomplished through the power of God and the Lamb, Jesus Christ. There's no way for humanity, for us to accomplish this. The more we try, it seems like the more we mess up. It's the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, the Lamb, that is able to do this. Do we really believe this? That God's got it? That there will come a day when he will come fully to dwell among the people, to create a new heaven and a new earth? that evil will be completely eradicated and there'll be no separation between God and humanity. The fact is we can't really prove it. It's really a matter of faith. Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. But God does provide us with glimpses of his kingdom here on earth. And that helps us to stay faithful and helps us to continue to overcome. And one of those glimpses was yesterday when I visited Sherry's dad. Um, he, uh, and certainly not me, all I did was stand there and pray for him. But he was, uh, he had, uh, he was passing a lot of clots and very, very painful. And as I was praying, he um, had another clot and um, he managed to pass it very, um, very easily and in a very short space of time. And so for the family, they really sensed that that was um, an answer to prayer at that moment, that God was with them, Jesus was with them at the moment. So it's just a glimpse of that. But I want to read to you, um, and I, I, I pulled out, it, I didn't, it's kind of long. It's called, this is an article that I, I read by Jeremiah Bazarik. And now he works at the Mustard Seed, and he also is one of the pastors at Mosaic House. Some of you might have come across this. It was in the banner, so I don't know if any of you already read it. Um, but it's called The Tent City of God. And that title kind of struck me because I hear I was looking at the, you know, the New Jerusalem, the city of God, right? So this is called the Tent City of God. And I pulled out a couple of paragraphs because just to make it not quite so long. Um, but hopefully this will still make sense to me. And, and then I, you know what, I'm not even going, I'll let you, I'll let it sit with you and you guys can talk about it. During the pandemic, an indigenous prayer camp developed into a tent city named Pekawewin. I passed by the prayer camp often on my way to my work at a local inner city agency. Some of my friends lived there. One day I biked up to the camp and the first person I saw was someone I knew from my time at the King's University. He was volunteering to cook the meal that evening. The next people I saw were two members of the tent city. One was an indigenous woman looking for a shopping cart 
She was in the process of moving homes after a conflict with a neighbor. The other person was a man I had seen around the inner city. He gener generously offered to give me a tour of his home. My guide told me that he felt safe and connected to others in Pekawewin, and it, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but yeah. He showed me where his tent was. His friend had given it to him, and now they were in the same neighborhood in the camp. Walking, we saw that the indigenous woman had I had previously met had found a cart and was enlisting others to help with the move. One leader of the camp told us that Pekawewin is a true community. There is harmony and joy, but also conflict and general craziness, such as typical for those experiencing homelessness. This kind of community might be seen as unusual or even dangerous to many of us who are used to four walls and a fence. I wonder, however, how our Lord views those who live in tents. In scripture, one of the most formative experiences for the Israelites was their time in the wilderness. The Lord wanted the memory of this experience forever etched onto their hearts and bodies. He commanded Israel to enact Sukkot, the festival of tents. Unlike Israel, history has tended to favor houses over tents. Historians note that nomads are often seen as suspicious or even dangerous. The stripping away of the indigenous cultures within Turtle Island, a term some indigen indigenous people use to refer to North America, is one horrific repercussion of this deep prejudice. This pervasive worldview has affected the way we view cities as opposed to tent cities. While cities are celebrated for overcoming wild land and draining its abundance, tent cities are criticized but for their temporary nature, unruly like the wind or a gopher sneaking about. In fact, cities try to eradicate these tents through policies and practices that some say are based on Western societal values of possession, control, and mastery. In his book, After Whiteness, the theologian Willie Jennings argues that these three values have morphed into demonic virtues we embody and, and idols we cherish. These idols constitute what the great African theologian Augustine described as the city of the world, in which both the rulers themselves and the people they dominate are dominated by the lust for domination. Those who seek to possess, control, and master are driven by this lust for domination. In contrast stands the city of God. This city is not merely a grouping of houses and businesses. Rather, like ancient Israel, it is a diverse array of peoples and creation, all nations, in including diverse ways of relating to the land. In the city of God, declares Augustine, all citizens serve one another in charity, whether they serve by the responsibilities of office or by the duties of obedience. In Pekawewin, I experienced the tent city of God. There, I was invited to imagine an alternative to these idols. Instead of striving to possess and hoard things, my community guide gave me a comb from a toiletry bag someone else had given to him. Instead of seeking to control and dominate a community by mandating how one ought to live, Pekawewin was a place where nomads, housed, housed volunteers, and guests like myself were invited into community. At the end of my tour, my guide invited me into his tent. He offered a mattress to lie on and some food. Even though I had a home very different from his, I felt welcomed and loved. Instead of being a collection of independent masters, the tent city was a place where everyone depended on each other. It was also a place where people must learn to depend on the creator for their needs, safety, and sense of belonging. In my community guide's tent, we prayed. We quoted our favorite Bible passages. Mine was Psalm 23. His was John one. 
In this tent city of God, I was presented new values of generosity, charity, and interdependence. To be sure, tent cities have their own demons to contend with. However, I believe that inside their tents is salvation, or at least healing from our idolatries. As we learn from the tent city's inhabitants how to re resist our idols, I pray that we might also be used as instruments of our Lord to heal the brokenness they too face. May the Lord of all peoples, nomads and city dwellers, walk with us into the wilderness ahead. I felt both encouraged by that article and challenged. Where are my idols? How do I relate to other people? So I invite, oh man. Can they have a little bit of time for discussion, Travis? Yeah? yeah? Okay, we're gonna take a bit of time for discussion. I was a little worried, it's a little long, and I was like, how do I cut it shorter, but it's a little hard. So um, I invite you to go around tables, and there are some questions up, and um, so that is the actual picture of the tent city, and, and as you know, if you go around downtown, you see tent cities everywhere, right? So this is the picture of that particular tent cities. Um, so in what ways does Jeremiah, no, it's not Jeremiah, the book of the Bible, <laughs> description of the tent city of God show you glimpses of the final coming of God to dwell, um, to dwell here, pitch his tent among the people. In what other situations have you come across that show you glimpses of God's kingdom? Um, and how does this encourage you to overcome? So I invite you to go around the tables, and I will give you a, um, a few minutes. Travis is, is letting us take a little extra time here. So uh, gather around your tables. Uh, if you're not at a table, I invite you to join the table. I think there's enough chairs. Um, otherwise, grab a chair and add to it. <laughs>